thank you for being here for our webinar on vitamin D with Dr. David Grimes. He's a medical doctor who qualified at Manchester University in 1966. Dr. David Grimes trained in medical specialties in Manchester and London and was appointed consultant physician and gastric enterologist in Blackburn in 1977. In trying to understand the nature of Crohn's disease, this led him to the importance of immunity and the role of vitamin D. He also became aware of the poor health of people in the Northwest as opposed to the Southeast, especially the socio-economically disadvantaged and those of South Asian ethnicity. And this also led him to understand the importance of widespread vitamin D deficiency in the pandemic that we've just experienced. So we're very, very grateful to have you here with us, Dr. Grimes. Thank you. And um, sure. I'll switch my um, video. I, in fact, I think I'll need to keep it on <laughs> because I'll be going over now to share the slides for you. And please just say next, next, next as we go through them. So okay. Martin, I'm going to share my screen now and go to the PowerPoint, which is here. And Dr. Grimes, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So my name is David Grimes. I'm now retired, but nevertheless, I've had a lot of experience of clinical medicine and also been aware of the plight and disadvantaged of the, the poor and the socioeconomically disadvantaged, also uh, the South Asian population living in England. And that, as we've heard, led me on to vitamin D. Next slide. Next. The story, of course, started in terms of evolution 4.5 billion years ago when the Earth was created, but not in the form it is today. Next. It was a billion years later that life began. And this is an interesting story in itself. It was the result of the interaction between seawater and rock. Organic life obviously had inorganic origins. Next. It took a billion years for the evolution to produce bacteria and viruses. That was all. But now, 1.5 billion years ago, we had the evolution of plankton. And this was absolutely critical. Small animals in the oceans, 1.5 billion years ago. Next. They had a problem and that they were vulnerable to solar ultraviolet. They would live close to the surface of the ocean and would thereby be damaged and killed by ultraviolet radiation. And so they developed, or evolution developed for them, two mechanisms which allowed them to survive. One was what's called vertical diurnal migration, which means that they sink um, to two or three meters deep in the ocean during the daytime, which protects them from solar UV, and they rise to the surface at the nighttime. You might have seen photographs or heard of experience of people who sail across the Atlantic. And during the nighttime, the ocean is glistening with phosphorescent uh, plankton. They come to the surface during the night, and many plankton are phosphorescent. Now, the other mechanism of protection against solar ultraviolet Next, is the ability, they have the ability to produce squalene, which is a long chain fat. It's an oil, basically. It's known as shark oil. Next. Now, nature doesn't have straight lines like I've just illustrated, and things tend to coil up, and the squalene is no exception. And here it is coiling. And it doesn't take a great deal for it to form more bonds. Next. And the development, actually the development of squalene itself was very complicated. It sounds simple, but it required all these steps to evolve before squalene. Next. Which we can see at the bottom corner. 
for that to evolve, all these steps. Now, near the top on the left, you can see in red statins. You know about statins. Statins block the formation of fats going down this line. Why statins don't create a huge number of untoward effects is in itself a miracle. But basically, we get to the point of squalene, and it says below there, cholesterol. So statins block that going to cholesterol. Now, by good fortune, as we'll see in a few moments, statins do not get into the skin. And this is of critical importance. Next. Squalene is converted into 7-dehydrocholesterol, also known as 7-DHC. This is the step before cholesterol. Next. And here we see the molecule of 7-dehydrocholesterol. And uh, we can see from squalene, bits of it have joined together to form four rings. Next. Now, this molecule is actually the sunscreen of plankton. It's plankton's sunscreen. What a sunscreen does, it absorbs ultraviolet energy and converts the molecule into something else. And the energy from the sun breaks this molecule, this interatomic bond, only this one, in 70 hydrocholesterol. As a result, the molecule becomes unstable. Next, and turns into this, what's called cholecalciferol, but also vitamin D, as we know it today. Now, this is the waste product. This is the side, this is the end result of the absorption of uh, ultraviolet energy to protect, this, uh, protect the plankton. Vitamin D is a waste product. Next, plankton are a rich source of vitamin D. Next, but they have no use for it. And it was a billion years before, plank before vitamin D managed to gain a function. Next, now plankton, here's a food chain. We have algae, which decompose into nutrients and also um, consumed by zooplankton here, or also phytoplankton. There are two forms of plankton. And uh, the zooplankton produce vitamin D next, and they get eaten by fish. Next, fish cannot produce vitamin D. We know very well that oily fish contain a lot of vitamin D. Yes, they do but they can't produce it. They can only consume it. They can only eat it by eating plankton. Next. And here we can see a little fish will eat the plankton, a bigger fish will eat the little fish, and the biggest fish will eat the other fish. So there we are, vitamin D is entering the food chain, all coming from plankton in the sea. Next. And it finishes up with this, a lovely kipper, smoke kipper, which I, I, I cook on the barbecue outside so it doesn't smell the kitchen out. And this is what we could almost regard as the most, the, the most healthy breakfast of all. We have a kipper, fish, protein, fat, vitamin D, and together with tomatoes, also a source of vitamin C, and no carbohydrate at all. And I think this would be a very healthy breakfast. It's not one I have every morning, just I think on special occasions. Next. Now, when plankton were introduced by evolution one and a half billion years ago, evolution then stood still because anything that evolved beyond plankton were infected by and destroyed by bacteria and viruses. You might remember the story War of the Worlds uh, by H.G. Wells in the film. And the invaders from Mars were conquering the earth, but then they all died because they had no protection against bacteria and viruses. 
well, viruses were unknown by at the time of H.G. Wells, but bacteria killed them. And bacteria would kill any evolving animal without immunity. Next. But 500 million years ago, defensive immunity evolved. You know, it took a billion years for it to evolve. It is a very, very complex pro process, but it's essential to kill bacteria and viruses. Without immunity, we die. It's as simple as that. Next. So this production, this evolution of immunity, enabled the Cambrian explosion of animal life, which you might have heard of. Next, there are only fossil evidences of this, but this is some of the fossil evidence of some bizarre and large numbers of unusual sea creatures, which themselves became extinct, but they're the forerunners of us, basically. Next. Now, the key to immunity is the molecule called VDR, which stands for vitamin D receptor. It's highly complicated and it won't work on its own. By a freak of evolution, it has to be unlocked by vitamin D. So 500 million years ago, suddenly vitamin D had a function and it still has that function. Next. This is a a, a representation of the large protein molecule of VDR. And in the middle, you can see the turquoise balls, which represent the vitamin D molecule. Now, VDR is like a big, powerful car. You might spend a lot of money on a great big car. Or it might not be all that big, but a powerful car. But it won't work without the key. Lose the key and the car is of no value at all. You can't do anything with it. And without vitamin D, VDR will not work. But with vitamin D, it locks into a specific place, just like the key of your car locks into a specific part of your car, and then um, it, it springs into action, as vitamin D does. Next. Now, vitamin D can only be formed in one way, by ultraviolet light acting or ultraviolet energy acting on the molecule 7-DHC. Vitamin D cannot be manufactured in the laboratory, and it isn't manufactured in the laboratory. It's only through nature that we can have vitamin D. Next. Starts off solar ultraviolet, acts on 70-HC in plankton, next, and it acts on 70-HC, which is synthesized in our skin. We, we all know that we have oily skin. It's, it's healthy to have oily skin. And part of the oil is 70-HC. And when we sit in the sun, and when the sun is strong enough in the summer months, then Ultraviolet light converts that 78C into vitamin D in exactly the same way as happens in plankton. Next. So 78C can go in two directions. When the sun is shining significantly, that is in the summer months, 78C in the skin is converted into vitamin D. When it's not, so when there's no sun, is converted into cholesterol. Now, 70HC elsewhere in the body can be converted into cholesterol, but if it's deep inside the body, it cannot be uh, converted into vitamin D. What we found, and what I found a number of years ago when I was doing research into this topic, is that during the summer months, blood levels of vitamin D are high and, in, and cholesterol is low. But in the winter months, when there's no sun, vitamin D levels are low and the cholesterol levels are accordingly high. So this is the trade-off, really. Vitamin D, cholesterol. Next. This is what happens. Now, we're taking food, vitamin D, cholic alcifer, we're taking in from food or synthesized in our skin. And it passes in the blood, the long black arrow is the blood. 
it passes into the liver. And in the liver, it's converted into something called 25-OHD, otherwise calcifidiol. And it, an OH group, hydroxyl group, has been added to the molecule. It then circulates the blood in its reserve, its reservoir form. And it's circulating in the blood, waiting to be called into action. When we have blood tests for vitamin D, we don't actually measure, or vitamin D itself is not measured. What is measured is the 25-OHD, the usable form of vitamin D. That process from vitamin D in the liver converted into 25-OHD is a very slow process, which we'll come on to. When vitamin D is required, it's required by immunity cells. And when it gets into the cell, it has another hydroxyl group added to make it 125-OHD or calcitriol, which then acts with the VDR, which we've already seen, the vitamin D receptor, added to which is RXR, a vitamin A derivative. And the, together, this complex will activate the genes in the nucleus. And in the immunity cell, it will stimulate the cell to both reproduce and to produce defensive proteins, which then go out into the tissue fluid and act against the bacteria and viruses. There is something else, and that is in a long time, many, oh, I think it was about 300 million years ago, 300 million years ago, specialized immunity cells became bone cells and allowed the creation of bone because bone is a fairly recent development. And so we get bone cells also require the vitamin D, the calcitriol. They get it from the blood and it's made there in kidney cells. I don't really want to talk about that. I want to concentrate on immunity rather than on bone metabolism. So we can see there the process by which vitamin D is activated. Next. Now, a, mo a vo molecule of vitamin D can only be used once. Otherwise, we get too much of it. If it was converted into the active form 125, then it would build up in the blood and be dangerous. So it can only be used once and then it is inactivated. Next. Shown here. Vitamin D from skin or diet in the liver becomes calcifidiol, 25 OHD. In immunity cells, calcitriol, 125 OHD. 125 OHD, and then when it has been used, when it's been locked into vitamin D receptor, VDR, and then released again, then it's converted into 24, 25 OHD, which is inactive. End of story. What this means is that we, when we have an infection, when we have an infection, our blood levels of vitamin D will go down the vitamin D has been used up. So when we have infection, we need to keep on with it. We need a constant supply of vitamin D to maintain our blood level. Next. Now, vitamin D is produced in the, is produced by ultraviolet acting in our skin, but not very much when we are my age. I'm not ancient, I think about, 40 years ago, if I can consider that people of my age, which is 79, would be agents. But when you get to 79, it's not so bad after all. Next slide. Now, vitamin D is only produced from 70HC. You might be aware that as we get older, as we age, our skin becomes dry. It's not producing the same amount of oil. That includes 78C. Our skin is producing less DHC. Therefore, we can sit out in the sun as long as we like. We're not going to get much vitamin D. Next. We can see here. Um, we can see somebody with a blood level, or two people will say, two groups, blood level of 10, which is very low. You remember that for later. And we can see young people in blue 
and after a single exposure to ultraviolet, the blood level rises to about 45, which is an excellent blood level. It drops off again because we have to have a constant supply of vitamin D. We can see it in the elderly. It goes up only less than half that, only up to 20. And 20 is not a good level to have. So the elderly people do not have the capacity to, um, to, to create much vitamin D. Next. So all elderly people are deficient in vitamin D unless they take a supplement. Next. Now, where do the supplements come from? Next. This is where they come from. Not from the, um, the grass, not from the, the, the shrubs, because plant life does not produce 70HC or, uh, or vitamin D. It comes from the sheep. So the sheep are wandering around in the sun. They produce 70HC in the skin, just the same as plankton, just the same as we do. Um, it, it gets into the, in, into the wool, of course. Now, what happens is when the sheep are sheared in the summer, the wool is sent off to have the fat, the oil removed. People don't want oily wool, like nice, nice, clean wool. Uh, the wool is treated with an organic solvent, toluene or xylene, I'm not sure which, and that contains the vitamin D. The solvent is sent off to China, where the vitamin D is extracted, and put out commercially. And about 80% of vitamin D is used for animal feeds. Vets are well ahead of the game. Vets know far more about the importance of vitamin D than doctors of human beings do. Now this extraction, the, the, the wool from the sheep takes place mainly in Australia and New Zealand, perhaps exclusively. Next. So solar ultraviolet acting on sheep, the oil from the wool is the source of supplementary vitamin D. Next. Let's go back, think back to two th early part of 2020. Who died in large numbers from COVID-19 in the UK? It was the elderly, the obese, the black African and South Asian ethnic groups. Next. All these groups have been known to be severely deficient of vitamin D. This was known before the pandemic. Next. Why were they not protected by correcting vitamin D deficiency? It is a scandal that they were not protected. Next. We've looked at the elderly. Let's look at vitamin D deficiency in the obese. Next. And here we have, as before, we have vitamin D as 25 OHD measured in the blood. We have controls, which are people who are not obese and the ones who are obese. And we can see the blood levels before were extremely low at uh, five nanomoles per liter here, extremely low very deficient. And after ultraviolet exposure, we had a good response in those controls up to 45. Whereas the obese, it only goes up half that amount. Why do the obese seem to produce only half the amount of vitamin D from a standard exposure, half of vitamin D in the standard exposure to ultraviolet? We don't know how much vitamin D they, they produce, but we know how much 25 OHD appeared in the blood, half the amount. What is thought to happen, or what does happen, is that the vitamin D being fat soluble and oil, it, it is absorbed by the excess fat cells in the body. And it seems to be a one way journey. So the vitamin D is trapped in the, in the fat cells of the obese. So anyone who is obese will need to take about twice as much vitamin D as somebody who isn't obese. Next. 
a higher supplement of vitamin D is required in the obese. Next. What about the South Asian and Black African ethnic groups? Next. This shows a number of healthcare workers. All who died in the early part of the pandemic in 2020. In March and April, 26 working doctors died from COVID-19. 26. Some of them are here, I recognize them, but there are more besides. Of the 26 doctors who died, 25 of them were South Asian or Black African ethnicity. Only one was white ethnic. This is terrible, absolutely awful. And it was known beforehand that they were vitamin D deficient, yet there was no public health action given to protect them. We know that a dark skin is less efficient at producing vitamin D than a white skin. Now, if we take someone from Africa who came to live in England and London, we'll say, then his risk of dying from COVID-19, if he came, say, from Uganda, was a thousand times greater from his brother in Uganda than he was living in London. Huge discrepancy. There was very little in the way of COVID-19 deaths in equatorial Africa. But moving from equatorial Africa to somewhere close to the North Pole and the equator is a serious problem. We know when we go abroad on holidays, we should take precautions in respect of health. Well, I don't know why it is not well known that people coming from Africa and South Asia to live in England should not take the health precaution of a vitamin D supplement because they most certainly need it. Next. This is looking at some research that I did a number of years ago, about 30 years ago. Now, the shape along the bottom is a series of columns. <clears throat> 1,574 columns, each representing one person. And they're, they're lined up in order of the vitamin D level because the height of the column represents the vitamin D level of that individual. Now, this is the range. The middle of the range is shown by the vertical orange arrow. If we take the ye uh, yellow line from the, um, from the middle of the range, the median, we can find out that that is nine nanomoles per mil. In other words, half of this group had very serious vitamin D deficiency. The red line shows what would be a reasonable blood level of vitamin D. And we can see very, very few had blood levels um, which were in the safe zone. They might have been taking vitamin D supplements, I don't know. I know that the one with the highest level was a man who, when I asked him why, how he came to have such a high blood level of vitamin D, he didn't know about supplements, but he was eating Bangladeshi fish twice a day, sometimes three times a day. I asked him where he got his Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi fish from. He said, I get it from Tesco in Accrington. So I go along to Tesco in Accrington, <clears throat> and there it is, Bangladeshi fish. Good for him. Shows the importance of it. But this is a serious issue, this level of vitamin D deficiency in South Asian ethnic people living in, 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 in um, East Lancashire. Next. Next. This shows white ethnic people living in the same place, 818 of them again, vertical black lines for each one. And this time we can see the middle of the range. We can see that reads off at 18 nanograms per mil. In other words, that is twice as high as a nine nanogram average 
median average in the in the South Asian group. We still see that more than half have significant vitamin D deficiency, and very few have a blood level which is in the ideal range. In fact, this is true in most countries of the world. About 85% of the populations, except in Black Africa, uh, Equatorial Africa, about 85% of the populations are vitamin D deficient. I was reading just today, and that's the case in Spain, where there's a great deal of vitamin D deficiency. We think of people lying on the beach in Spain and getting absorbing all that ultraviolet energy. Well, those aren't the Spanish, Spanish people. Those are the British people and Germans, etc., going there. The Spanish people keep out of the sun. Only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, as has been observed. This is a big widespread problem, and it should be faced. It's a big public health issue, and it's being ignored. Next. <clears throat> a lot of good research has been done in Israel during the, um, the pandemic. And this is a study of people who were on the critical care unit in Israel actually in Galilee, during 2020. Now, they'd had blood levels of vitamin D undertaken a year or so beforehand, and these records were available. So when people came into the critical care unit, the records of vitamin D in the past were looked into, and this group of people were identified. Now, if we look at the critical care patients who are known to have blood levels of vitamin D performed, over 90% of them had very, very low blood levels, less than 20 nanograms per mil, less than 50 nanomoles per litre. I must apologise for the fact there are two units of measurement in use, nanograms, nanomoles. Increasingly, nanomoles per litre are coming into fashion, into use. If you have a blood level of vitamin D measured, you need to remember the number, but you also need to know what, which units were involved. So 90% had very low levels and the other 20%, uh, the, uh, sorry, the other 5% uh, had um, quite low levels. Below 20 is not good. What we can see is that of the critically ill people, none of them had blood levels of vitamin D above 30 or above 40. And I pointed out in the previous slides that 30 is, is about the safe level and 40 is, is better still. So this is showing us how serious it is to be deficient in vitamin D. These are the people who died from COVID-19 people who are critically ill from COVID-19. It is a vitamin D deficiency is very serious. Next. Now, the ideal blood level is determined by clinical experience. There is no such thing as a normal blood level of vitamin D in that most people are deficient. There is only an ideal blood level and it's experience such as we've just seen from Israel that shows us that the ideal blood level is above 30 nanograms per mil. Next. Now, we have in this country, in the UK, SACN, the Standing Advisory Committee on Nutrition. And this oversees vitamin D which is very, very little to do with nutrition. And the group is, the committee is a bit out of its depth as far as vitamin D is concerned. It makes statements saying that vitamin D is essential for bone health, agree. And it says there is a suggestion that vitamin D might be helpful in immunity. Well, that just show, that statement shows a staggering level of ignorance of research has been taking place during the past century. Next. So the ideal blood level as stated by Sacken is not less than 20 nanograms per mil or 50 nanomoles per liter. 
if you if you got 20, that's fine with second, but it's not fine with COVID-19 and a variety of other illnesses. Next. So vitamin D, essential for bone health. Yes, it is, especially growing bones in children. Uh, without vitamin D, they develop soft bones, um, rickets. But it's also in, important for immunity. For bone health, we only need a, a low blood level of vitamin D, such as SACN identifies. But for immunity, we need at least twice that. Next. Once again, as I say, ideal blood level is determined not in the laboratory, but it's by clinical experience. And we don't know the clinical experience <clears throat> until we get until we start measuring blood levels of vitamin D, as has been done in Israel, in Galilee. Next. <clears throat> so from clinical experience, we can see that the ideal blood levels are between 40 and 60 nanograms per mil, 100 and 150 nanomoles per liter. And keep these in mind. Next. How do we achieve it? How do we get to a decent blood level? Next. Well, 80% comes from the sun. But we need to, you know, ideally, well, most of us live indoors. We work indoors. Uh, being retired, I spend more time out in the sun now. But on the other hand, I have less capacity for producing vitamin D. Um, next. We don't get enough vitamin D in the winter. If we're living indoors, if we're elderly, if we're obese, if we're extensively clothed, and if we have a dark skin living distant from the equator. We touched on those. Next. <clears throat> as a result of all this, vitamin D deficiency is very common, as we have seen, especially in the South Asian and Black African ethnic groups, especially in the elderly, especially in the obese. Next. This is, again, some interesting research done in Israel a number of years ago. And this looked at the extent of vitamin D deficiency. Now, Israel is a very sunny country. Not much cloud, not much rain. We can see that 50% of the population there, or this big sample, was severely deficient in vitamin D. Less than 20, less than 50. Severe deficiency in half the population. In only 15% of the population, was there a blood level greater than 40 nanograms per mil, 100 nanomoles per litre? So if we put the other three columns together, we can see, yes, 85% of the sample were deficient in vitamin D, and 50% of them severely deficient. This is serious. And I think it's being taken seriously in Israel. Next. How do we get the sun? Well, we can look at this. We can see people in houses. I think this, these are in London. You can tell by the style of the houses in London. They've got a little bit of space at the backs of the houses, not a great deal, no front gardens, not a great amount, not a great opportunity for outdoor leisure at home in this environment. Next. Similarly, in Chester. Very, very nice terraced houses from the industrial age in Chester, with a nice pub on the corner. Again, not much activity there. Next one. And this is the backs of those houses. There's no back garden. They had a backyard, which is mainly for the toilets, which you can see there. And the, although I no doubt they will have indoor toilets as well now. And, um, and that's where the coal was kept as well. So no opportunity for outdoor leisure. Next. Compared to my house, and well, not the house, but the garden. And I have a nice garden. And on a sunny day like this, and on a sunny day like we've had today, I can be out in the garden. And yes, we can find out that people with gardens have higher blood levels of vitamin D than people without gardens. And that's through some research that I did a number of years ago. And correspondingly, people without gardens tend to have higher blood cholesterol levels than people with gardens. So if you have a garden, you're very lucky. You'll have more vitamin D 
and you'll have lower cholesterol. But we can't all have big gardens like this, I'm afraid. I wish we all could have. But as housing is being developed in the Ribble Valley where I live, people do want gardens. And a lot of the countryside is being built over, providing people with houses that have gardens. Good. So let's not grumble too much about the fact that the countryside, to a certain extent, is being built over. Next. Vitamin D from food, that's the 20%. Oily fish and from meat. Also from mushrooms. The thing about mushrooms is that they are, fungi in general, are closer to animal life than they are to plant life. Oily fish produce or we sod off with um, plankton. They produce vitamin D in a form that is strictly speaking called vitamin D3. And oily plankton, oily fish, meat, humans, um, we all produce vitamin D3. Mushrooms, on the other hand, have a slightly different metabolism. It's something similar to 70HC that they produce, it's not quite the same. And they produce what's called vitamin D2, which is almost as effective, but not quite as good. But the mushrooms mu must be um, irradiated with vitamin, with ultraviolet light before the vitamin D, D2 is produced. So don't, don't get um, too hung up on mushrooms. But yes, the mushrooms are there, but make sure they're out in the sun before you eat them if you want to get vitamin D from them. Next, vitamin D. One unit is measured in units, should be, and one unit is 20 billionths of a gram. Now, the unit was defined in the 1920s. And in the 1920s, it was not possible to measure something as small as 20 billionths of a gram. It was a biological assay. How much vitamin D is required for um, a 10 gram mouse? Well, a ten, an immature 10 gram mouse. And he said, well, when they found out how much that was, they said, right, we'll call that one unit. Very sensible. The same sort of thing was done with uh, defining insulin at a time before its weight could be measured. Next. So here we are. I need one unit of vitamin D each day. Now we need to remember that because we need to scale up from a 10 gram mouse to a 60 gram human. Next. So on that basis of the 10 gram mouse, a 60 kilogram adult human would require 6,000 units a day. And that goes for all ages and all ethnicities. 6,000 units a day for 60 grams. Next. That can be taken once a week. It, it can be taken once a month, but it's best to make it, take it more frequently than once a month. And each week is ideal. Um, it's easy to remember once a week, fairly easy to remember. And I take 40,000 units of vitamin D every Sunday. And if I forget on that particular Sunday, I might remember on the Monday or Tuesday, so I take it a few days later. If I forget for the whole week because I'm on holiday or something, I'll take double the dose the following week to catch up. It's all slow, cumulative. 40,000 units each week, all ages and all ethnicities. Next. It's easy to find 20,000 unit capsules. Next. And here is what I take every day. I've blanked out the trade name. 20,000 units of vitamin D3. This is cheap. I buy it from my local pharmacy just down the road in this small village where I live. I didn't ask them to get it. Just, I just happened to see it. I couldn't believe they had it in stock. And so 28 capsules that allows for six months supply, assuming you drop a couple. And that costs about eight pounds. So it's not very much for a year's supply of vitamin D. Actually saying that, no, if I take 40,000 units a day, it will last me only for three months, not six months. 
So 40,000 units is what I would recommend each week. 40,000 units each week, once a week. Next. Now, what about the obese? On the same scaling up from the mouse, 120 kilogram human would require 12,000 units each day. And so on with adjusting for weight. Next. 6,000 units per day is 150 micrograms. Sacken advises us to use micrograms. That's pseudoscience. It just causes confusion. Most people haven't heard of micrograms. They think in terms of milligrams. And if you take 150 milligrams of vitamin D each day, you're taking 6 million units, which is dangerous, very dangerous. Next. Avoid micrograms. There's great confusion. Next. Now, what about the effect of, of vitamin D on the, on the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK? Next. Here we can see what happened in 20, U, UK deaths from COVID-19 each day during 2020. This data was taken from, um, it was taken from uh, World, Worldometer. And we can see we'd had in the 28th of March, not the 28th, the, um, the 24th of March, we'd had 28 deaths from COVID. So we had lockdown introduced. I can't pretend that lockdown was, was dramatically beneficial as the number of deaths went up very rapidly. But the number of deaths went down substantially during the spring and summer, down to virtually zero in August 2020. This is the effect of vitamin D production and the vitamin D reserves built up during the time of that production. And as the vitamin D reserves are being used up, the, the number of deaths went up again later in the year. Next. This appeared in the Mail Online on June the 22nd, only a few weeks ago. Since the COVID-19 epidemic started, multiple studies have shown, have repeatedly shown a link to vitamin D deficiency. Correct. That is absolutely right. Yet when Matt Hancock was asked about it, he wrongly said that a British study had found the opposite. Is he ignorant or incompetent? Well, he's misinformed anyway, because he was wrong. It's as simple as that. Next. This is disinformation. Officials admitted that it wasn't true and claimed the health secretary misspoke. The officials should have been advising him and they might have misadvised him. Heaven knows how he got this so wrong. But these unsuccessful trials of vitamin D did not occur. And that was corrected on the 23rd of, July, of June uh, this year. Next. The COVID-19 pandemic, is it over? Well, next. This was data from just a few days ago. In 15 days, up to August the 4th, we'd had 9779 new cases, 285 deaths from COVID. It came as a great surprise to me because I thought the pandemic was over. We don't hear anything about it. The government stopped telling us. I got this information from our world in data. Next. That equates to seven, 600 new cases per day, 30 deaths per day. Next. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK in 2023 has been about 200 deaths per week which contrasts with what appears to be excess deaths, 1,000 deaths per week, excess of what we'd expect over the years 2015 to 2019. This data comes from a website called Our World in Data, which I advise you to look into. It has a huge amount of data in there, not just COVID, not just deaths, all sorts of things. We might want to look at COVID-19 deaths, Excess deaths, and you'll get the information. Next slide. Well, 
I was going to talk on the second pandemic, but we're not allowed to talk about that. Next. The government has introduced the CDU, which is the Counter Disinformation Unit. This is free to look at, Department of Science, Innovation, and Technology. Anyone can look at this on the internet. This is not a secret organization. It is the Counter Disinformation Unit, and it's looking at so open source information collection and analysis. It will be looking at what we're doing today. And that's why I'm not going to say any more. Next. I'll just leave you with this as the final slide. Israel, the danger of a low blood level of vitamin D. And the people with the higher blood levels are happy at home or somewhere enjoying themselves, while those with low blood levels are critically ill. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much indeed, Dr. Grimes. That was um, fantastic information. Very, very useful for us all. I'll just um, stop sharing. There we are. And um, we have some minutes left because we started a little bit late. I hope people will bear with us if we do go a bit over the hour. Are you able to, Dr. Grimes? No problem. I've got the whole yeah. evening free. Oh, thank I've you. To talk, so, talk and converse with you for another two hours. No trouble. Oh, thank you very much. Because um, I've been sharing, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, so I'll have to be a bit uh, spontaneous about the questions that I choose. Let me just um, open up the chat and then I'll look at the Q&As as well. So um, I'm just having a look at the questions that have come in. Um, I'll just take them one by one as they've come, if you don't mind, Dr. Grimes. Would vitamin D help diverticulitis, do you think? Unlikely to. Diverticulitis itself is, is, is pretty rare, but very nasty when it occurs. But it is an infection. But um, vitamin D always helps with infections. If someone with diverticulitis is going to have an operation, then no question vitamin D will help. The blood level of vitamin D is very important in post-operative recovery. Anyone who's going to have an operation should take vitamin D for at least a month beforehand. Thank you. Um, what do you think of vitamin D supplements in general is a question here. Do you think one needs to be cautious uh, which ones one chooses? No, I won't be, you know, won't be cautious at all. As long as you keep to units, you're okay. If you start talking about micrograms, then start talking about milligrams, you're going to be in danger. The dangers of vitamin D are staggeringly low. It is exceptionally rare. There was one case report of vitamin D overdose um, in the British Medical Journal during the pandemic. And this was a man who was mad, basically. And vitamin D doesn't really help people who are mad. He was taking countless supplements in vast quantities and one of them was vitamin D. Anyway, he had a bit too much calcium in his blood. He was treated um, for a, a couple of days, and then he was fine to go home again. But some people are mad with what they well, take. It, it's because it's fat soluble, isn't it? So it builds up over time. Some, like vitamin B, wash out and yeah. build That's up. Right. In sort of it thing. takes a while to go down. You're absolutely right there. What was treated for the for the very quickly? was the effect of the excess vitamin D, we should increase the calcium level of the blood. And that's very easily treated. Mm. Um, I'm aged 65. I take 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin daily. Would a vitamin D capsule be advisable for me to take daily? Yes, most certainly. It would do much more good than the levostatin, than the statin. Mm -hmm. Statin won't be of any benefit, but vitamin D will be of immense benefit. Yeah. One um, question here is how old is elderly? In other words, what are you defining as being elderly in your statistics there, would you say? Well, with age, the amount of 7-DHC produced goes down gradually. So it's not, it's not sudden. And I think by the time I've got now to very close on 80, I will have produced much less vitamin D than I would have done 10 years ago. 
So over the age of 70, I'm sure there is a significant loss of 70HC and thus a loss of uh, vitamin D production. Just to keep to the same topic for a moment, what do you consider an overdose of vitamin D? Is it best to take once a week or every day? Well, I take it once a week. It's easier to remember that way. It doesn't really matter. Overdose of vitamin D is exceptionally difficult. But it would be higher than the doses that you've suggested, I imagine, in some people. Oh, gosh, does, it yes. matter, does it matter how well your vitamin D receptor is working? Ah, well, I didn't touch on that. But some people have genetically determined poor quality vitamin D receptor, VDR. It's genetically determined. And people with vitamin with polymorphisms wow. of VDR are at risk of vitamin D underactive. Well, the vitamin D doesn't work, basically. Mm -hmm. And I remember vividly two or three patients with this who I picked up in the hospital, uh, people with Crohn's disease, actually, who had VDR malformate, uh, polymorphisms, and the vitamin D just didn't work. I'm afraid they were stuck with it. We optimized their blood levels of vitamin D, but if they didn't have, you know, having a key to the car is okay, but if your car's pretty broken down, it's not gonna go very well, I'm afraid. Um, sheep are dipped in organophosphate. Um, What's the implication of that, please? I can't answer that question, I'm afraid. It's something we could look into, isn't it? It's interesting. Um, I don't really know. I thought organophosphates were in, were in the weed killers or insecticides. No? Well, they do get dipped in them um, from time to time, I think, uh, sheep dips. Um, you know, I don't know whether they're used in Australia and New Zealand as much as here. I've not come across that, no. No, okay. Um, is it better to take uh, vitamin D supplements with a fatty meal, do you think? I don't think it matters, quite honestly. Okay. And is vitamin D assisted by the addition of vitamin K? Vitamin D activity is needs vitamin K. Now, the point is, I don't take vitamin K. I take the view that I have plenty of vitamin K. There's no reason to suspect myself as being deficient in vitamin K. But I know very well that without a supplement, I would be deficient in vitamin D. So I take what I'm deficient in and to rely on a good diet to provide me with enough vitamin K. OK, here is a question about multiple sclerosis. Yes. What levels of vitamin D would you think are optimal in MS? Now, I might know a lot about vitamin D. I don't know a great deal about MS, but I know there is a very, very strong case for vitamin D being important in protection against multiple sclerosis. One of the most interesting studies I saw was, of, um, was in pregnancy, that Babies born in the spring have a, have a higher risk of multiple sclerosis compared to babies born in the autumn. And the reason is that a baby born in the autumn, the mother is pregnant during the summer months, and it's during their last phases, it's during the last three months of pregnancy, really, that the vitamin D is essential for brain development, brain maturation. That's the big thing then. Whereas the Woman who is pregnant uh, or conceives in the autumn and is pregnant during the winter, she's not going to get the vitamin D that um, she should be getting. And the baby will be born in the spring, will be at a disadvantage. There are several disadvantages along this. But to my mind, I think it's I, I think that every woman who goes to the antenatal clinic should have a blood level of vitamin D tested there and then. And if she's deficient, she should be given a supplement during the pregnancy and indeed beyond that pregnancy. That is the time to pick up vitamin D deficiency in pregnancy. Yeah, that makes sense. That's very much fascinating. There is a lot of, lot of information about vitamin D being necessary uh, or, or multiple sclerosis occurring in the vitamin D deficient. Yeah. Yeah. There is actually... Um... 
talking about the Coimbra um, protocol, which we did mention earlier. Here, someone has been recommended to take 200,000 units a day. Now that seems extraordinarily high. And the question is, what weekly dose would you recommend instead? When she had her blood tests, she had virtually no vitamin D in her system. It's a hard one to answer without knowing the context, isn't it? Well, it is, but never mind. Uh, if she had no vitamin D effectively in her blood to start with, she requires, in theory, in practice, a normal level of vit a normal amount of vitamin D, suddenly, just the same as I take the 20,000 units a week. That should be ideal. But she's been advised to take 10 times that. OK, um, the doctor concerned must have a good reason for doing so. And it has been shown very, very recently, only this year, that, that dose of vitamin D is not dangerous. It's, it's 10 times what I would take, or it's five times more than what I would take, but never mind, it is not dangerous. But if it is going to be a high dose like that, the blood level should be monitored. You should be supervised. Yeah, and interestingly, if she had virtually no vitamin D3 in her system, perhaps she had that VDR yeah. uh, deficiency that we've just mentioned earlier, the polymorphism. Oh, no, if she, if, she had, if she had VDR polymorphism, she could have the normal blood levels of vitamin D in the blood, but it wouldn't work. The vitamin D wouldn't work. It wouldn't activate in her system, I see. It wouldn't, it couldn't, it wouldn't activate vitamin D receptor because it's malformed. I see. Good. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question here. Do you think it's necessary to take vitamin D in doses that you've described, even if someone is living in a sunny country and spends a lot of time in the sun and has a diet rich in fish and meat? Um, it, it seems the answer to that is uh, no, they don't need a supplement. If they really live in a sunny country, get to spend a lot of time outside and they eat a lot of fish, I don't think they will need a vitamin D supplement, no. But most people in sunny countries tend to spend most time indoors in the air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. So again, if there's any doubt, get a blood test done. Yeah. It sounds though like they wouldn't need vitamin D supplement, no. Despite supplementation, some people can't seem to absorb vitamin D. Um, examples are those with uh, gut permeability or celiac disease. Do you have any tips to increase absorption? No, there aren't any tips to increase absorption. If someone has celiac disease, then hopefully it'll be treated. And if it's treated with a gluten-free diet, then the intestine will work perfectly normally again. So that should be OK. And there shouldn't be any other good reason why they can't absorb vitamin D. It could be if they've, got, if, if they've surgically lost a lot of their intestine. You know, the short bowel syndrome. It's sometimes called that could be a problem, but then the vitamin D can be given by injection. Okay, thank you. One question I think you've already answered, which is should one take um, vitamin D with water, food, or what would you advise? I think you said it doesn't really matter, right? I, I don't think it matters, no. Quite honestly. And you also, another question here is can one take a lower daily dose of vitamin D rather than a higher weekly dose? And I think you said the benefits are equal. Yeah. The benefits are equal. It doesn't matter. Whatever whatever you want to do. I just yeah. take it once a week, but there we yeah. are. And does it matter what time of day one takes vitamin D? Are there any studies on the actual um, circadian rhythm and how that affects when one takes it? I've not come across any studies. I, I doubt if it will matter, quite honestly, the time of the time. I, I take it when I get up in the morning, when I'm in the bathroom. Okay. Well, another several are here on the Q&A. I won't keep you for a lot longer, sorry, but we'll just answer, ask these because they are very interesting ones. And um, this attendee is interested to know the significance of biphosphonates in the chain illustrating the squalene pathway. Yes, I, I noticed that as well. I wasn't aware of it until I prepared that slide. And I knew that, I knew that um, statins are in there. But the biphosphonates, I thought, what are they doing there? What harm are they doing? You know, interfering with a, a, a major important metabolic chain like that is potentially very damaging. And I, 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 I'm not happy about medicines that might be damaging, quite honestly. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know is the answer. 
Yeah, well, maybe we could look into that as well. And then yeah. underneath your presentation, pop a few yeah. answers to these uh, very knotty questions. And this is another one that could be complex. Is it accurate to say that exposure to sunlight could result in a reduction or can result in a reduction of cholesterol levels? And consequently, could it be recommended for individuals with high blood cholesterol to increase sun exposure as a potential approach to lowering cholesterol? Yeah, well, if someone is, the answer to that is yes. The effect of the sun on lowering cholesterol is not actually very great because although we've seen the metabolic chain in the skin inside, it's not influenced by the sun. What I would advise someone concerned about cholesterol to do is stop being concerned about it because cholesterol does no harm. It, it, it's, it's a great, there's a great fallacy, there's a great industry around cholesterol and statins, which is bogus, basically. Oh, okay. Thank Sorry you. to have to say that, but... No, totally understand and agree, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well... um. Lots and lots of questions there. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, you know participating and over the hour as well, and for all of your questions. And thank you, Dr. Grimes, so much for all your expertise, great knowledge. There are lots and lots of thank yous and expressions of um, gratitude here in the Zoom. We'll okay. save all of that for you, including the questions. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly before we finish that we will be having another webinar on the 22nd of August, that's another Tuesday, where Dr. Armin Schwarzbach will be talking about long COVID pathogen reactivation, testing and therapeutic options. So that will partially be a, a replay or a repeat of what he uh, talked about at the Integrative and Personalized Medicine Congress. It will be live, of course, and so he'll be there to answer questions too. And on the 26th of September, Dr. Robert Fakirk and Melanie Aldridge will be talking about reset eating, taking control of your health by turning your food into powerful medicine. So we look forward to those as well. So um, we'll be sending out the recording of this as well as the um, or at least a link to it, as well as the PowerPoint, um, very soon. Dr. Grimes, um, is that okay that we use your PowerPoint? To so certainly it is. One of your information. Thank you so so much. And if anybody um, would like wants any more questions answered, please send to me, contact me by email. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll send out your email then, if we may, to those certainly. who've taken part. Please do so. And thank, thank you very, you very much. much indeed. Thank, thank you. you for your hospitality. Many thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.